we go to our uh, final talk of the day. So we have a very remarkable entrepreneur, Sonny Wu, who uh, is a serial entrepreneur and technologist. He sold his last company for $260 million um, and became then the CTO and president of the um, fossil group part for like connected devices. And he has a very interesting vision on how he looks into products and technologies that are out a few years and how you can productize them and bring them to market earlier. So that's like kind of been his, his mantra on how to really create outstanding and successful products. So I'm very much looking forward to hear from Sonny. Thank you for making it all the way from Vietnam, yeah. I believe, like that's straight right. to here. Thank you very much. Come on, guys. This is the grand finale for today. All right. Boy, this is, uh, I feel a little nervous here, uh, standing between you and dinner. So I'm going to try to make it quick or at least entertaining. All right, so uh, I wanted to try to be practical, you know. I uh, didn't want to just always... Uh, we've heard a lot of cheerleading uh, today. Uh, let me try to see if I can uh, at least uh, share some stuff that I've learned uh, from failure, you know. Uh, Subtractive knowledge always uh, more useful than additive knowledge. All right, so background on myself and uh, ooh, two microphones. Uh, some lessons learned and uh, a final quick word on what I think is uh, is the number one uh, most important role as an entrepreneur. So uh, this is my core staff, my wife and two kids. This is us on a typical Saturday morning, playing around. Uh, my background: I was born in Vietnam, uh, came to the U.S. when I was a little kid. Uh, went to school there and have done a series of startups and most recently I did a company called Misfit which I sold to Fossil Group, uh, a fashion uh, company. Uh, at Misfit, we, uh, I started with two of my friends, uh, Sridhar, who have, uh, roommates in college, and John Scully, an unlikely longtime friend, but uh, it's a long story. Um, so uh, we just had a great time doing this. It, we just worked our tails off. Uh, we had no idea how hard this space was going to be. Um, we didn't really have that much advanced technology, so we had to go for design, and uh, it kind of worked. Uh, so we, we did, uh, went for good-looking products, products, wearable technology that didn't look like wearables, and uh, so more like jewelry. So this was back in 2013 when um, it was, I think, easy, a lot easier to do a wearable startup. Uh, sold it to Fossil Group, which is a fashion group uh, that sells uh, watches and accessories for a number of fashion brands. And now, uh, after I, I just left Fossil uh, about uh, two or three months ago, three months ago, uh, started a, a group called Alabaster, and our uh, aim here is to help founders use breakthrough science to make planet-level impact. So deep tech startup advisory uh, work. Uh, occasionally, we're investing in companies that uh, we get involved in as well. I can tell you more about that later, but I'm so glad to be here. I just came here from Singapore, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening there, as you can imagine. Uh, second flag, there's the North Korean flag. So, lessons learned from failure. Uh, hopefully, nothing to do with Singapore and what's going on there. We're hoping for success there. Uh, I wanted to share five uh, lessons from five areas that uh, hopefully will be helpful uh, to folks here. How many uh, startup people, entrepreneurs? I know you guys are tired of raising your hands. All right. Okay, good. Well, this is for you. Uh, so hiring, you know, this is something that I don't think they teach you this in school, you know. Um, I certainly don't, didn't learn this in school, so I thought I would actually share some of the things that I've learned Oh my gosh, Ep from, from epic failure, okay? Just uh, hiring, just having the, the, the worst hires. Um, I must be truly desperate. So to come to me don't hire me. in desperation. Uh, when do we start? So um, second, right, uh, no, in terms of committees, you, know, there's, there's always, you can always have your committees, but when you have your hiring committees, remember to hire for strengths, not just lack of weaknesses, okay? Uh, there's always this tendency to try to get folks who, um, you know, they're not bad at the, this, this, or this, you know, well, you, you know, in, in a startup, you're looking for someone who, uh, you're looking for folks who are epically good at something, right? Um, and you might end up with a bunch of misfits. Working with people you like, this is something I learned from John. Uh, you know, I, I used to think, well, you're John Scully, you can uh, just work with people that you like only. Uh, but, you know, as an entrepreneur, we gotta hustle and, you know, deal with whatever we got. 
Um, and I've just learned over the years that, that that's just not true, that you really do have a, uh, you, you do have a choice. You can wait. And it, it actually really pays off in the end to be committed to having a jerk-free environment. So these are the three things that uh, I would say that I've learned over the years, over the last three, four startups. Um, in terms of the who, you know, uh, for my first startup, we hired all sorts of really smart people. Folks who uh, just, you know, from famous schools, you know, uh, won all sorts of prizes and whatnot. And I just found out that, and they, we just had a bunch of social problems. You know, a lot of know-it-alls, a lot of folks trying to flex their intellectual muscle and show off. And what you're really looking for in the end is uh, folks with a lot of skill, relevant skills, not just IQ. Uh, second startup, we hired a bunch of folks with uh, a lot of experience. And instead of having people with 20 years of experience, we had some people who had one year of experience 20 times. Didn't work out so well either. And in some cases, that was worse. And so um, what we learned is what we're looking for is people with great wisdom, people who are, who are right all the time. You know, great leaders are often right, and that's what you're looking for, not just experience. And finally, um, having a commitment to have cultural cohesion in your team. You know, uh, the word culture gets thrown around a lot, and I think uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's lost its power. Um, but if you just think about uh, uh, in terms of uh, co cohesiveness in a team, uh, I think this is incredibly important. This is what we aimed for a lot at Misfit. I'll talk to a, a little bit about this in just a second. So in terms of the who, um, skill, people, folks with, who are competent, wisdom, great wisdom, and uh, cultural fit. The real obvious question is, how do you test for something like this? How do you interview for these things? Well. I haven't really found a great uh, formula for that other than uh, I just, uh, is in just trying people out. Um, and if folks are willing to uh, work with you for a week at a time, uh, to, uh, that's probably the best way to, to find out. Often, you don't have that luxury, so, uh, you know, you'll, but if you can try, uh, have a trial period, uh, I think that's very important, not just for the company, but also for the prospective hire. All right, values, you know, I was just talking about cultural cohesion. So um, before we talk about values, I wanna talk about how not to do values, okay? So uh, these were Enron's core values, communication, respect, and integrity. Didn't work out so well, right? Um, and I think it didn't work out well because they didn't really, it, these kind of those values are, um, uh, just didn't drive any decisions. I mean, when would you ever say, you know, I don't really feel like uh, having integrity, you know? That's probably, you know, of course you're gonna have it. So uh, what I've learned is have set up values that, ha that, that, are in, that, that, are, that really cut to the matter, that really will help drive decisions. So I don't know if we did it right at Misfit, but I'll just share with you what we did, you know? Uh, first was be a misfit. So we always insisted that people, um, that you know, you should try to do, do things differently. <clears throat> and in fact, we used to say that if you didn't fail at something in the first year, you'd probably be let go. We, it was more like something we said. I don't know if we actually did it, but uh, uh, it was something that was important to, uh, to communicate, and that was that you know, um, a failure was, it was okay. It's not a good thing, but it was something that uh, was acceptable and it comes with the job. Doing more with less, this isn't just about uh, spending less money, uh, we're not paying people, not good, uh, but about uh, using fewer words, use, having fewer features, uh, doing uh, fewer things and being more excellent at them. Uh, so that was an, an important part of what, what uh, we were about. Most important uh, was uh, servant leadership, that uh, the folks who rose in the organizations were the ones who were expected to serve the most, uh, serve their team leaders and their team leaders were expected to serve uh, their, uh, their direct reports who were expected to serve their users. I really believe that is the only way yeah, you could really, or I don't, maybe it's not the only way, but it's the only way that I know of to uh, really build a user-centric organization. Um, otherwise, it's a CEO-centric organization, uh, which is not great. So whatever your values are, whatever you think are the non-negotiables, okay? Very few non-negotiables in life, uh, but whatever they are to you, Think for yourself and then stand up for them. 
Uh, thirdly, people. Uh, we talk a lot about people. You may recognize this picture. This is the PayPal and the Mafia. Three things that I've learned over time. Uh, there's a lot of focus on trying to get talent, but uh, part of me also thinks, you know, from having been married for 10 years, it's really about trying to maximize the potential of every person. Uh, this is a great uh, picture of a guy who goes around London and giving homeless people haircuts. Uh, honest, regular, two-way feedback. Two-way feedback, that's the, that's the key, right? Uh, it's something that uh, we've uh, really uh, found to be important. Uh, so we, we had this uh, bilateral feedback process where um, uh, uh, team leaders and direct reports were required to do uh, every six weeks. Uh, if you're interested, I can send you the template. It's been something that we've refined over the years. My partner and I, uh, we've done this uh, literally over 20 years, over three startups, and it's, uh, it's worked fairly well. And uh, finally, letting people fail. You know, it's uh, having an environment where it's very clear that failure is not a good thing, okay? It's never a good thing. Uh, but that it is acceptable and that it is expected, actually, uh, it's, like I said, it comes with a job. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, a mentor, uh, also an uh, investor in, in previous companies, uh, from Vinod Kosla. Uh, oops, I don't know if it's playing or not. People are usually limited by what they attempt, not by what they are capable of. So I think this is some sort of national championship team game. So again, people are usually limited by what they attempt, not by what they're capable of. So true, uh, so true in life, especially startup life. So there we go, uh, maximizing the potential of every person, regular two-way feedback, uh, and letting people fail. I'm going through this quickly just because, uh, you know, I wanna, I'm conscientious of your appetites and uh, dinner time. Uh, fourthly, the environment. Uh, I really think it really comes down to one thing, and that is making work not feel like work. Making work uh, be a joy, um, to be something that time passes effortlessly. So at uh, Misfit, we had uh, a few things. This is what worked for us. Uh, first was uh, providing work that gave people a sense of purpose, that we're trying to help make people look better and be healthier. Um, creating an environment where people, where you're working with people you like, uh, not just uh, uh, people that you had to work with. And finally, this sounds a little uh, trivial, it might sound trivial, but being surrounded by good food. We didn't have expensive food. We didn't have fancy stuff that you'd get at the big tech companies um, out there, uh, but we had really good food. Uh, stuff that people liked, that was healthy, and, uh, and made with a lot of heart. So people knew that we cared about them. Um, Another favorite quote from another mentor, John Scully. One of the benefits of working at a startup is you get to do things you're not qualified to do. Isn't that so true? You know, like, you know, you got 24-year-old VPs of engineering, you know, 19-year-old, uh, you know, high school dropouts speaking at conferences. Unbelievable, you know, like what kind of, this is 2018 and, well, I think this kid's got all of us beat. So I, I'd, I'd love to be driving one of those things. But that's, this is kind of like what, uh, what uh, startup life is like, right? Uh, we're doing things that we're not qualified for. And how wonderful that is. I mean, just two or three years of startup experience is probably equal to 10 years in many other situations. So enjoy it. And finally, I'll leave you with uh, one last thing I've learned uh, over the years, over the several startups, ethics. So. Give first, get later, okay? It's uh, probably easier said than done, but uh, it's not that hard, I would say. Um, but when you approach relationships, when you approach partnerships with a, a heart of giving first, not thinking about what comes back, I really do think that it comes back in the end. I, I really, and it's certainly, I feel like it certainly has for us. At Misfit, we were incredibly uh, fortunate. We were. Uh, you call it providence or you call it luck, uh, boy, we had a lot of uh, either one of those, whichever your worldview is. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, this final quote from another great mentor, Chairman Lee, uh, and he would uh, say, always leave money on the table for the other side. Uh, negotiate hard, fight hard, work hard, be aggressive, be relentless, okay? 
uh, but leave money on the table for the other side, and I really do think it will come back for you. I do have one last point. Um, do we have time for that? Six minutes, seven minutes. Wow, okay. Um, so this is what I think is the most important role for entrepreneurs. Uh, I wanted to share that with you, but uh, any, I'd, I'd like to hear what you guys think. What, what do you guys think is, the, is what for you has been the most important role uh, for you to play as entrepreneurs or people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Any, uh, any thoughts? Philip, how about you? Disrupt. Disrupt, I love it. Okay, I love that word. It's kind of a buzzword, but I like it all the same. Any other words? Uh, any other? Communicate. Communicate. Okay, that's a good one. You're definitely going to be doing that a lot. Enthusiasm. You've got to be the chief cheerleader. Okay, that's a good one. That's a really, I think we're getting closer. Passion. Passion. I thought she said fashion. I was like, oh man, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I did work for a fashion company, so, you know. But yes, passion. You know, you've got to have, it's got to be heart, right? Not just brains. Any other thoughts here? Problem solving, that's a really good one. Yes, you are pretty much doing that day in, day out. I'll take one more. Anyone else? Yes. I'm sorry? Empower. Empowering all the stakeholders in your company, and you know, employees, partners. I think that's a good one. I think, you know, uh, we have elements of all of those points here. But I would say sales. If I had to just, if it had to come down to it, I would just say sales. And here's what I actually mean. First of all, you know, I'm not talking about the stereotype around sales, okay? Sell me this pen. Okay, big whoop, you know, like, uh, I don't think I like being around people like that. Uh, you know, so I don't know if we'd have people like that in, in the company. Uh, but you do have to sell the customers, okay? That's the obvious first thing. But remember, you're also trying to sell team members. Uh, these are folks who are going to be joining you, who are, you're going to be paying far less than what the market rate is and with far less job security, okay? Even on a risk-adjusted basis, imagine what the stock options will be worth. Even on that basis, they're being a lot less, let's, let's face it. And, uh, but you know what? Bill Gates made it work, right? And it seemed to work out well for him. Investors, uh, you know, you're trying to get folks to give you money when they really should not be giving you money, okay? This is incredibly high risk. They don't know who you are. You've never done a startup before, you know, or maybe you have, and uh, you just got lucky, you know. Second, entrepreneurial success apparently is not a great indicator for future entrepreneurial success. So um, you're trying to convince partners, these big companies, these big logos, you know, that you want to have on your funnel chart. I mean, the funnel, they're not closed. And you're trying to get them down to the close. And it's just, uh, it's hard because they really shouldn't be working with you because you might not exist in six months. You know, you're thinking month to month, maybe quarter to quarter, but these guys are years at a time, right? Um, and finally, trying to get the media, get folks to write about you. Maybe you can get John Biggs to write some article about you in TechCrunch when, you know, you really don't have a whole lot. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's, it's hard. This is uh, what you're doing day in and day out uh, as an entrepreneur, I think. Folks who are in the trenches as founders or CEOs here, you know what I'm talking about. This is what you're doing all day long. Um, and, uh, well, I think that is, uh, so that's it for me. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's really just an honor and a pleasure to be here in Romania. I was not expecting this to be uh, what it, I mean, I, just the vibe I'm feeling here is amazing. I was just doing some quick uh, research when I, before I got here and um, I was just blown away by the level of talent here. I just could not believe it. I mean, so um, these are stats you guys already know, but for the folks not from Romania, you know, I had no idea that Romania had, so I, I, the most telling thing, the first sign I saw on the back of a bus when I got off the truck, uh, got off the, the plane this morning was an advertisement for the International Math Olympiad being held here in, in Cluj. Right, the, the 59th or the 58th International Math Olympiad, how cool is that? You know, you're not talking about LeBron James or whoever, you're talking about the Math Olympiad. That, for me, is just heartwarming, that's so cool. And then I looked in the stats, and it turns out Romania was the first host for the International Math Olympiad, and uh, apparently is the number two country. You guys have more medals than any other country in the world, except for one, I won't mention who that is. Um, it's a neighboring country, apparently, in Eastern Europe. 
but not bad for a country of 22 million people. So it's, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, when people talk about the level of talent, they're not kidding here in Romania. It's really spectacular. So very cool to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, being in touch and chatting with you uh, tomorrow. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. I think you said you'd be open to take a few questions from the audience. Is that? Oh, right? yeah. Oh. Yes. Sorry. Uh, questions? Any? Okay. We'll have um, microphones coming up. Yeah, we have a microphone there and a microphone there. So if you have a question for Sonny, then you can like raise your hand because otherwise I'll ask him a question, and then somebody with a microphone will will come to you. Any questions for Sonny on how to create your company out of Romania or anything else that you would like to know? I think people are hungry. <laughs> yes, probably they like ask you about it's where to get good food, but I, I'm, I'm exactly. not sure if that's something that you know after being like. That's right. But I, I, I would have a question. Yeah. So because you've been like selling your company, so um, and you said like that like sales and like like driving that is the most important part. So can you share like the negotiation when it comes to the final moment to sell your company? Oh, how how company. was that? How was that for you? Uh, so I, I guess it's pretty nerve-wracking, and because there's a lot at stake. But at the end of the day, um, it happens if if the, if uh, I, I think like one of the most important things is finding like a really great cultural fit. You know, with uh, with Fossil, I thought it was just an awesome fit at the time because you know they valued what we had, we valued what they had. And you know, it's a fashion company, uh, really transforming itself into a tech company. How cool is that? You know, and uh, so they sold you on their vision. Yeah, I mean, we were the ones who were being sold. It was great. We, yeah, so we were we were tickled, really. That is very cool. Okay, and ah, sorry, we have questions. Hi, uh, congrats for the presentation and for the vision that you have uh, uh, set. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you were to start over, what would you do different? If I had to start over, what would I do different? Um, I think I would have, I would warp past all of the learnings that I had. You know, I would warp past trying to get just really smart people. I would go past just trying to find uh, people with lots of experience. You know, I would go straight to finding the most cohesive, culturally cohesive group I can. And this sounds a little radical, okay? But I would actually only hire based on culture. And if we lacked competency, we would outsource literally everything. If, uh, if, for example, if we were to do Misfit again, uh, if I had to outsource design, I would. You know, if I had to outsource engineering, I would. Which sounds crazy, because I mean, as a tech company, outsourcing engineering, are you crazy? Not at all. But if you can't find great cultural fit, do not hire. Um, and I would really be a lot more um, rigid on that than I was in times past where you know, we'd get someone who was really awesome at something. Oh, they're such an amazing, I don't know, salesperson. And it turned out to be not a great fit. You know, uh, Jack Welch, his famous, famous thing was uh, for folks, because, you know, you have that two by two grid, folks who are competent uh, and folks who align with your values. And so the, the, the usual quadrant in question is what happens to folks who, who you find are really awesome, they hit their numbers, but they don't align with your values. And you know, you think, well, maybe we'll put them in a corner somewhere or something like that. No, actually what you do is you seek, you don't just let them go, you seek them out and, and eliminate from your organization because they have the greatest potential to negatively affect your culture. You know, I, I know this sounds like a, a, an abstract lesson or whatever, because it's like, oh, you know, if you're successful, you can like define a culture. It's not true, you know, uh, we, uh, it's not that once, you're, once you have a certain size or level of success, you can afford to have cultural fit or have principles. It's not true. You know, these are decisions that you can have from the very beginning. Yes. OK, we have a question right here in front. And by the way, I totally agree with that. I've screwed that up so many times, and it hurts you so badly. Yep. Whenever I hired somebody who wasn't a cultural fit, it turned out really badly for me. Yeah. And I wanted and to convince myself, this guy is yeah, awesome. I'm sure they'll for it work out. You know, I'm sure maybe they'll change. No. no. They never change. First of all, I would like to say good evening. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Patricia Colleen. And Sonny, congrats for this great presentation. And congrats, Taxylvania team, for this great event. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm actually from Transylvania, from Târgu Mureș, but I've studied uh, Turkey 
I, I spent 12 years in Cluj, and right now I'm working for a trade shift in Bucharest. I'm part of a startup team. Well, I have some questions for you. You said earlier, you, you said you heard fashion. What's your favorite color? My favorite <laughs> color? Orange. Yeah. Orange. Why? It's just, it makes me come alive whenever I see it, you know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. You said earlier that it's important to focus on culture fit. What do you think about hire based on attitude? Mm. And secondly, on skills. You know attitude. what Simon Sinek says, you should hire for attitude. Because attitude. skills can be taught. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think that's very analogous to what I'm suggesting as well. You know, uh, attitude. Uh, values, that kind of thing. Now, the thing is, I, I do want to say that values can change over time. You know, like we added stuff over time because we're like, because someone came in and they were just awesome and I'm like, man, I want the company to be a little bit more like her or, you know, uh, and uh, so, you know, it's okay to, to evolve. I mean, you, you should be evolving as an organization. Uh, but skills, you know, um, I would argue that skills can often be learned. But there are many skills that are just, like, there are folks who are just, like, you know, epically good at something, and they're just not part of your organization. That's okay. See if you can hire them as a consultant and get, you know, and get their, get their skills. That's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you think entrepreneurial skills can be learned? Entrepreneurial skills? Um, I don't know. I, I think so. How? Only one way to find out, right? How? By failing a lot. <laughs> Quickly right now, and cheaply. I mean, I know, <laughs> on other people's money. Right now, money. I'm an HR and marketing professional. Yeah. I plan to to accomplish something in a yep. few months, probably or earlier. And I would like to offer us some advice. Yep. Uh, when is the right moment to start your own business or startup, or how do you want to call it? Someone asked me. It so, said once, you know, that if you ask. The question: Should I do a startup? The answer is no. I, I like like um, our our CEO like told me like a, a a proverb, which is like kind of like when is the best moment to plant a tree? And said, well, the best moment is yesterday, and the second best moment is now. There we go. And I think that's pretty much similar to this. Like, when is the best moment to start your company? Yeah. Well, it would have been a great moment to do it like a while ago, but yeah. the second yeah. best moment is now. So I think like I very much agree on this proverb. Th there was one lady. Okay, here maybe one question. final question. Thank yeah. you very much. It was, and oh, then. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, she, she had her hand up a while back. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. So I've read in the book that um, I will, uh, after this meeting, I will uh, look, search for Misfit. I'm sorry, I don't know much about it right yep. at the moment. But I've, I've uh, <clears throat> read that uh, you work with founders to build companies that have a, a positive impact on a lot of people. Yep. Did you collaborate uh, with any companies to improve, to improve education on a national level? Because I'm really interested in this. Not yet, but I would love to. So, um, so this is a great kind of closing segue here. So, the uh, with Alabaster, we're looking for to to help uh, founders make planet-wide impact stuff that's really going to um, make a difference, right? So, much of what I'm doing is material science, biotechnology, food, that kind of th stuff that you can scale rapidly that has a, a large, you know, uh, technical moat, you know, an edge. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we that can that is planet-wide impact uh, that, that can make it the planet-wide impact is, uh, is is education is in fact education. There's a book that came out recently that I just absolutely love. It's called Drawdown. I don't know if you've, anyone's heard of this book, but basically they, it outlines the top reasons uh, strategies on how to reverse climate change, assuming you believe in that climate change is happening, which I think most people here do. Um, and apparently, number uh, five out of 100, you know, so electric vehicles was 26, okay? 26, that sucks, you know, that's pretty high, but it's not like two or something, right? You think Elon Musk is gonna change this world with uh, electric vehicles, it's not true. Apparently it's quite low, but just educating girls, five out of 100, it, you know, way, way you know, many, many times more uh, impactful than electric vehicles. Um, just, I think when uh, women have more education, they realize that you know, there's, uh, they're much more valuable to, to the world than just bearing children. And, uh, and as a result, you have fewer kids in this world. And that, 
lower population, one of the biggest uh, ways to uh, make an impact. Well, Thank you very much, Sunny. That was very inspiring. Yeah. And I learned a lot of things.